This particular uh, talk here is about Chrysler's PCI bus. And, uh, that's basically a uh, the kind of bus. It's just a one-wire bus. Some of your buses have got two wires, some's got one wire, and they communicate at various different speeds. And we talk about you know megabits per second and kilobits per second and all that. Remember, it's bits, not bytes, right? Okay, so in the black box technology, you know, that when it first came out, you know, there was a time when just about everything that was out there, you could uh, get an idea of how it worked on the inside. Then they started putting these black boxes on here. And uh, so each sensor and actuator was hardwired to the brain box when they had a brain box. And the first car that I ever ran into that had fuel injection on it that I ever saw anybody working on was a 68 Volkswagen uh, Squareback. My dad had a Bosch fuel injection on it. Had a couple of sets of points in the distributor underneath the breaker plate. The breaker plate's what the ignition points are on, but it had two sets of points underneath the distributor, and those would actually were the reference signal that went to the brain box, and that brain box would actually operate those fuel injectors based on that. And the uh, the earlier ones, that was in 68 and 67, that same engine had two carburetors on it. And then they went to the fuel injection there, and it had like 40 pounds of fuel pressure. But Volkswagen always liked to put these cloth-covered hoses with clamps on them carrying that fuel and all that kind of But anyway, um, but we would, uh, I was just totally captivated by that because I said, you got a computer in there that's operating the fuel injector just deciding how much fuel to put in there. It was really, really interesting, you know. And, you know, my dad was able to fix those things. And he didn't have all the training that you get from Volkswagen on them, but he had, you know, basically did it by roach, you know, in his little shop that he had by himself. But in the late 1980s, computers were networked and they spread their electronic tentacles into automatic transmissions and suspension systems and that kind of thing. In the uh, service bay, smart scan tools got the capability to see through the network into the solid state processor so we could figure out which inputs and outputs were, uh, were inconsistent. And so that was in the, uh, you know, in, in the time when I, was, uh, when I first started out. Uh, the most uh, complicated electrical thing that you had in the early 70s was like turn signals. Or you'd have, uh, you know, the unless it was like those um, funky uh, German fuel injected car. Well, different networks communicate at different speeds, uh, and there's eight bits in a byte. Remember what I told you before? So it's not, don't say kilobytes per second because that's wrong. Kilobits per second, you don't want to multiply your speed. So a protocol, what's a protocol? What's a protocol in an automotive context? I mean, anytime you talk about, you never notice that when you plug in this uh, uh, wireless vehicle interface, it says, you know, checking the protocols. You know what I mean? And it says basically, uh, when it's going through those protocols, it has to find which language the computer's talking, so it will know how to talk to it. That's when you plug in your generic OBD2. Now, if you go in there and select a vehicle, like if you want to say Chrysler 2000, Neon, blah blah blah, and all this kind of stuff, it's going to know which protocol to talk instantly. But it tries a bunch of different protocols. I've got a little scan tool I carry in my glove box. It's about the size of your hand. I can get you one for 60 bucks if you want one from uh, AE Tools and Computers. And it's a handy little thing. And it'll actually read data, PIDs, and all kinds of stuff. It'll do actually more stuff than the one at the parts house will. And, uh, but it's a little bitty thing. It's no bigger than that. And it's got a cord coming off. You plug into your data link, you know. And it's only OBD2 stuff, which is like 96 and newer usually. Uh, but anyway, uh, when the PCM shares engine coolant temperature sensor information over the network with the electronic uh, automatic temperature control, that's the network communication. So you're going to have one box talking to another box, giving it uh, what it needs here. Like uh, this box right here will have a sensor sending an input into it. See, if you, if you broke it down like this, you'd have your, your PCM, not PUM, PCM. PCM is going to have uh, two wires going out. One of them is going to be ground, and one's going to be, we're just going to do this with any coolant sensor just so we can. And um, Now, then we're going to have uh, a bus, and, and this was a one-wire bus. And you know, a two-wire bus is a redundant thing, and a one-wire bus has just got uh, like a little highway. Uh, imagine yourself uh, on an interstate highway, right? And everybody's on that same interstate highway, but uh, you may be wanting to take an exit at one place, and he won't take an exit at another place, right? So you're basically going to sort yourselves out. You decide which exit to take. Well, imagine yourself on the other end of that thing where you're the guy sitting here, and you can pick which car takes the exit. I see that car. I see that one. This is the car that I want because it, it knows you. As soon as it sees it, it grabs the piece of, you know, that car off the network, and it knows which piece of information. The problem is 
that piece of information keeps on going. So basically what you're seeing is the computer is just reading the bits of information that it needs and it the rest of, lets the rest of it go by. But when it reads it, it doesn't stop. It keeps going. So everything is available all over the network. It's kind of like, you know, you're turning on a light uh, and the light's everywhere, you know. And, but in this particular case, it's coming in little bursts. And optic fibers, you know, data is transmitted that way too. Do you know who it was that... Uh, first thought about sending voice messages over um, beams of light. Graham Bell. Graham Bell. He was the one that built, made the telephone, and he knew enough, he was sharp enough to make that work, even way back when he built the telephone. Except he used a glass rod, and there weren't no optic fibers back then. All right, anyway, this PCI bus right here is a copper wire, is all it is. Now, they have optic fiber stuff, too, and if you look at this uh, month's uh, issue of Motor Age, Vanessa Atwell wrote a really good article on uh, troubleshooting optic fiber systems. You might want to look at that. I got a copy of that on my desk right now. Okay, so this this system here is actually going to be talking to another box. What needs to know engine coolant temperature sensor besides the EATC? And what is the EATC? Electronic automatic temperature control, right? Okay, so what else may need to know engine coolant temperature sensor? Mm -hmm. What else may need that information? You got any idea? Instrument cluster. You're right. There you go. Give that man a cigar. And you're going to go to there too. See, but all the information that's being fed out by this PCM is going to every module. And so there's a lot of stuff. The, uh, this instrument cluster needs to know the speed of the vehicle, which is actually coming in here too, see. You know what I'm going? Speed of the vehicle is coming from a different place. It's coming in here. And sometimes they'll have the ABS module picking up the speed signal using speed, the regular speed sensors to do it. And they'll capture that, and they'll send it to the PCM where it is aligned and defined and sent out to other things like the cluster and the cruise control and all that kind of stuff. Although nowadays the cruise control is built into PCM on most of them. All right, so any of this stuff is fed that way. Now, so uh, another example, some traction control equipped vehicles use the anti-lock brake module to prevent wheel spin by pulsing drive wheel brakes uh, at the same time while they're calling on the PCM to retard ignition timing uh, to reduce engine torque. And all of them started out with simple uh, SAE class uh, 10 kilobit per second networks. All three domestic automakers started out with SAE class A 10 kilobit per second networks. Their scan tool hookups initially were proprietary and early networks were slow and cheap and cost very much. Well, Chrysler vehicles first used multiplex on their 1981 model Imperial electronic instrument cluster. That had two microcomputers. Uh, mounted on one circuit board and they talked via a simple serial bus within the electronic cluster. So that wasn't anything that mechanics ever got into, right? Okay, so there you go on that. That's where else we're in. 1988, Chrysler New Yorker and Dodge Dynasty vehicles were finally outfitted with full vehicle multiplexing. That means everything on the car was tied into the, the network, right? And they called that system Chrysler Collision Detection Bus, CCD bus. Remember that, Chrysler collision detection. Did it have anything to do with the collision? No, it did not. All that did was it was able to sort out those signals so that they didn't crash into each other. They weren't talking about the car crashing, they were talking about signals crashing in the line. See what I mean? It was able to sort that thing out and just pick out the signals that it needed. That was the way that I always read that anyway. But it had, I mean, it was really funny because it's a Chrysler collision detection. Sounds like you're going to, it can tell if the car has a crash. Right. Of course, I guess if you got an airbag, it sort of can, but I ain't got to do with this term. There's a variety of networks. Now, the PCI bus that we're talking about here I replaced Chrysler's earlier two-wire Chrysler collision detection network, and it communicates at slightly less than 8 kilobits per second. Uh, PCI is a one-wire network, got a yellow wire with a purple stripe or vice versa, and it utilizes the slower of the two SAE J1850 protocols. Can you remember that? Write that down. That's the SAE designation for that protocol, J1850, at about 10.8 kilobits per second. Switches between low and high voltage levels to generate signals. Boop, 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 boop. Like it. Yeah. I'm well, you're having to absorb that, aren't you? Yeah, we're talking a little uh, quick here. Okay, PCI bus low voltage is around zero volts. And high voltage is around seven and a half volts, which is half a charging system voltage. Got it? Half of charging system voltage is what the high volt is. And uh, whenever these bus, whenever you see these bus signals, you know, you're basically going to be looking at a square wave. It's going to, you know, like if you got a good clean scope, you know what I mean? And it's, they got little words that go through there. As a matter of fact, I can take this little uh, uh, breakout box that I got, and we can hook it up, and I can show you on the scope when it's talking what that bus looks like. 
Now there's no way that you can look at that and tell what you're looking at other than the fact that you can see that it's talking. You can look at the voltage thresholds and all that and make sure it's okay. But, uh, and I've done that sometimes. Like at one time whenever I was working on this uh, Ford Escort that wouldn't talk to the scan tool and the transmission wouldn't shift and the speedometer wouldn't work, I actually hooked up with my, uh, while I was hooked up with my scan tool and it was talking, I connected the oscilloscope to that wire that it was talking on and I could see a pattern there. But the scan tool still wouldn't read it and it turned out the pins four and five didn't have a ground. And it was a battery terminal connection. It was causing it not to talk. It was causing the speedometer not to work. It was only negative battery terminal and four, little, uh, four or five little black wires the hook in there. They plugged into a connector and it was all chalky. That was a bad way to do that. But anyway, that was a different kind of network than this. Uh, so the high and low voltage levels on a PCI bus are generated by means of a variable pulse width modulation to form signals of varying length. So each up or down square is a bit, and the bus can communicate with up to 10,800 of these pulses every second. Now that is fast. You're going to have to set your scope up on milliseconds to pick that up, right? And not very many milliseconds, right? So you got to use a good fast oscilloscope and set it to the 20 volt scale. Read in milliseconds. If the bus is shorted to power or ground, the scope trace will tell a tale with a dead flat line at 12 or 0. See how you use your scope to troubleshoot that? If it's shorted to ground. Imagine what's going on there. Your PCI bus is shorted to ground. There's all kinds of stuff that doesn't work. So if you get in there and you say this don't work, that don't work, and the other don't work, you're going to say, what do these all have in common? Let's see. They're all on the PCI bus. I wonder if the PCI bus is shorted to ground. It's just a wire. Come on, y'all. Whenever you short it to the ground and there's no signal going through it, you got issues there. All right, then uh, let's see. I'm not really talking fast enough or using enough energy to do this. I need some espresso. Anybody got any for me? If you don't have any espresso, you can make some, can't you? All right. All right, so, you, so you're going to take care of that by hooking your oscilloscope up on a 20 volt scale. And, you know, whatever your scale is, you know, it's going to, typically going to be a 20 volt scale, is the one that's closest to what we're after here. And you don't want to see a 12 or a 0. You want to see, you know, the square wave that's going from, you know, between zero and seven volts with little, you know, towers up and down it. PCI bus messaging uses variable pulse width modulation. Variable pulse width modulation. What that means is both the state of the bus and the width of the pulse are you used to encode that stuff. You see what I'm saying? All right. You understand? Everybody clear? Information's encoded that way. The state of the bus and the width of the pulse are both used to encode. In other words, how does it know what's being said? Pulse width, modu you know, variable pulse width modulation. All right, so you know what a pulse width is, right? Yeah. We talked about it on injectors. Yeah. You know, how long is it off versus how long it's on, this kind of thing. And that means that it's always, it's not always the same amount. Some of, you know, that's what variable pulse width modulation is. It can change that pulse width, and that's used to encode it, see, in the state of the bus. Uh, in reference to some transmissions? Yeah, to whichever, uh, yeah, tra uh, code transmissions, you know. I mean, basically, when it's looking at things, it's going to be coming down that pipe. It can tell by the, uh, you know, it's programmed to recognize certain, you know, pulses and all that. I mean, this is happening so fast that there's just no way you can you know, process it yourself, you know. Okay, a zero bit is a short low pulse or a long high pulse. You got me? Like Morse code or something. Yeah, vaguely, but we got ones and zeros. But a zero bit is a short low pulse or a long high pulse. Can you write that down? Put that on your notes. You may have to turn this over. You got a lot of notes on this. I've got a ways to go. What? Huh? What did you say? I said a zero bit is a short low pulse or a long high pulse. A zero, a zero bit is a short low pulse or a long high pulse. Okay, this is a uh, right here, 7.5. All right, see this? The length of this pulse can be a long high pulse and a short low pulse. See that? See how that works? Then you have various, you know, various different length pulses. But this bit and that bit have the same value. But the break comes between, comes when it switches states. So that's that's how it tells it's two different bits. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? If it wants to put two zeros next to each other, it's going to have to have something to separate them. So when it's a, if you got a long, uh, this one's long and that one's short. 
then those two bits in that word are zero. That makes sense. Are, are your eyes glazing over? <laughs> it reads the bottom of the. Uh... Yeah, it reads a low pulse and a high pulse. This is zero here. Now your various different networks use different voltages, different communications, different protocols. All we're talking about here is the PCI bus. And all that is is like an analog wave or whatever analog. No, is. it's digital. Analog is analog is like this. An analog is a variable voltage. This right here is either going to be seven and a half or zero every time. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's a, that's digital. It's all yeah, for yeah. own. And it's and it's because of the fact that a long low pulse and a short a long high pul pulse and a short low pulse is zero, it can have two zeros right next to one another. If it didn't have that capability, you wouldn't be able to put two zeros right next to one another, would you? I mean, that's the way I'm seeing that. All right, now then, uh, a byte's a series of bits. Imagine bits as letters that make up words. See, you got these here bits. They're going like, to make up words, and bytes are, are words that make up a message. So you got a bunch of different bytes, and each one is composed of a bunch of different bits. That's like letters composing a word and words making a sentence. See what I'm saying? Okay. So, and all this is happening with blistering speed, and this is a slow bus. The CAN bus is like 500 kilobits per second, which is 50 times as fast as this. See what I mean? That's swift, isn't it? It uses those for vehicle dynamics and stuff like that. You know, fuel injection, anti-lock brakes, all that, they usually the higher speed bus stuff, you know. Well, right, most of us have noted there's dozens of slightly different pin de designations on your uh, you know, your um, data link. And so there's three pin designations that can take you to the bank. Pin 16 is always supposed to be battery, and 4 and 5 should always be ground. Okay, so now most P codes are related to what? Like powertrain. Powertrain. What about B codes? Body or chassis. That's it. And no, no chassis is C. So body is B, chassis is C, and U codes are network. So it's important to understand that a no communication issue is not always network related. A new a no communication issue is not always network related. Huh? No bus issue where my uh, aunt's car wouldn't get no fuel or something. Uh huh. And it couldn't even fix it because it I don't know it just fixed itself as a being like an intermittent electrical thing or something. Yep. Yep. Well, maybe I don't know if that was bus related or not, but it's. It's irritating. You want to get that thing out of your out of your printer over there. All right. So, all right, so um, it's also important to understand that a no start non communicative PCM can be a result of shorted reference voltage. But the PCM now that's not on every vehicle. You know, Fords are that way. But you can. Uh, I've actually experimentally shorted the reference voltage line on a GM, and it doesn't typically cause that one to go down like it does a Ford. You know, although it may cause it not to communicate. I don't know. Uh, a blown fuse can take down a PCI bus module as well. So if you got a, if the module's got to have power and ground going to it, or it ain't gonna talk. Just like your computer. You know this lady that said that uh, she she calls this helpline. She says my computer won't boot up, and so they got to trying to talk her through it on the phone. And you know this power strip down here on the floor that I got. She had the cord from the power strip looped around, plugged into the power strip. You know what I'm saying? The, power, the plug that was supposed to be plugged into the wall, somehow she had managed to plug it into the power strip. And she didn't realize that, you know, she just had a bunch of cords there laying on the floor, and she plugged them all into the power strip, and the power strip wasn't even plugged into the wall. Its cord was plugged back into one of its own sockets. And her computer wouldn't boot up, and she was trying to figure it out. Right? And uh, my son Luke had this whole situation where he said that he works at, he's a, he does IT work up in Georgia at a company up there. And uh, he said the uh, people... Uh, called him and says, my computer will only boot up at night. In the daytime, my computer will never boot up. He said, I can't get it to come up under any circumstances. And so he goes in there and he looks around. <laughs> it was funny as all get out. So he goes in there and the, the lights are wired to the wall plug. So when they go in there at night and they turn on the lights in the office, they got windows there, you know, where the light comes in. So they don't even turn on the lights during the day, apparently. So when they don't have the lights turned on, the computer's got no power. So when they turn on the lights, now the computer powers up. Anyway, that's one kind of thing. Okay. Now then, uh, we need to determine. Huh? They call it's clear. Okay. And diesel came, had an emergency. It was a legitimate emergency Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They came and got your plunger. 
didn't return it. You've got a brand new one. Okay. I ain't lending them nothing else. Okay. Yeah. Well, he actually, Tim actually left that one in there one set one Friday or something, and, you know, going to back up. But anyway. I got you a new one in there. Yeah. I appreciate um, that. Uh, company trucks out there, at your pleasure. You got it, man. We'll take care of it. I got some guys that are chomping in a bit to take care of that. And we're going to be checking that engine noise, too. Matt, put, Matt, put, your, Matt put your motor in there. Yeah. I don't do that. Yeah. It didn't do it this morning. Okay. Just sometimes it just seems like a little bit longer to warm up, but it's fine. Have you heard that? Uh, if you go on my YouTube channel, you'll see the little smoke test we did on your intakes, about 33 seconds. Pretty cool. On that intake or my Mazda? On your Mazda. It's doing fine. Yeah. No more clicking noises, huh? No, but that one day, anyway, it was a rough 100 feet getting it up here, and it cleared itself up. It was terrible. Yeah, yeah I always, I hate that guy. You don't ever know what caused it, you know? But uh, anyway, uh, Okay, let me see here. Uh, so the PCI bus, which is what we're talking about here, we got to determine if the Chrysler product we're servicing actually has that kind of bus. Some Chrysler products have it, later ones don't. Some later model ones dropped it, while others still come with it and operate in concert with a CAN bus. And so remember, a PCI bus is a one-wire bus. On the, uh, on the Ford, the bus that actually, one of the buses on the Ford, like what talks to the gym module, it is a one-wire bus. And it's like light blue with a white strap or something like that. It goes to the thing. Okay, and as a matter of fact, uh, in automotive electronics, I usually have them wire that module right there that you see on that board. I have them wire it up, and I got a little switch on there on this uh, other board that's got a wiper motor on it, so they can wire it up and let it, and watch it with a scan tool while they turn on the rear wipers and let it work interval and all that. Any of the other stuff you can do there, too. Anyway, we need to see which smart boxes are supposed to be connected to the bus and how many of the boxes are present on each vehicle. Okay, you've got to realize that each module has a specific termination resistor internal to its circuitry and to, to mitigate electrical interference. So if you don't have a terminated resistor, and what I, remember what I, yesterday when we were talking about that oxygen sensor, right? Initially we were saying, well, what we might want to do is short the oxygen sensor signal to ground to make it stay in open loop. If you just unplug the oxygen sensor, there'll be a little bit of Induct, induced current floating around in there that will confuse the computer into thinking there's something there that's not there. So unplugging the oxygen sensor in some cases causes it to run bad because it'll pick up stray voltage and all that stuff. And on, on these buses, they don't want any sort of crazy, you know, stuff going there. So you got that little termination resistor uh, actually shorts any of that away. Let me show you that. Briefly hit you with this. Watch this. This is important, guys. Now don't, don't drop this. This is part of your electrical stuff. It's going to be a little bit of a throwback to that. Um, I've got a, a Lincoln right here. You may hear me tell this story again, but I thought it was very interesting. And the guy says, when I'm driving my Lincoln, it had automatic temperature control, all the bells and whistles and all that stuff. I hit a bump, the blower stays on. The blower comes on high and it stays on high until I shut the car off and then I turn it back on and the blower goes back to normal operation. Every time I hit a bump, it happens. Okay, now, how are you going to start troubleshooting that? Check the wire, see if anything is... Instead of a blower resistor, this one has actually got a little blower controller. It's got a relay in there for high blow, and then it's got your a little variable uh, power transistor thing. The, the, the more you apply to the base on that power transistor, the more res, uh, you know current's going to flow through it. Okay, this particular one, I get my my long screwdriver extension, whatever, kind of like a pool cue with the engine running. I find this little resistor. It goes in the same place where the blower resistor would go if it was a Crown Victoria without automatic temperature control. I just bump it. And as soon as I bumped it with my uh, uh, long extension, it kicked on a high blow. So I started off a car, turned it back on, bumped it again, and did it again. What do you think? Bad part, right? Something wrong with that part. I mean, that makes sense to you? This is not a trick question, guys. What do you think? Well, it, 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 it was a question that tricked me because I ordered one from Lincoln Mercury because they had one in stock up there, and it was 100 bucks, And we popped it on there. Just like it was. Turn that key on, put it on high blow, tap that brand new one. Now what are you going to do? <laughs> you know what I found on that? And the reason I'm saying that is because this termination resistor is what's got me thinking about that. What I found on that was coming in there to that relay coil, which is supposed to be energized by the control head on the dash, I found when I unplugged it and I put my meter there, I found 8 volts there leaking out of that control head. Eight volts leaking out of the AC control head, and it was just enough to put some magnetism into that coil, but it wasn't enough to pull it in. However, if you bounced it, it would snap shut, and that eight volts was enough to hold it. You get me? 
That's what was going on there. Okay, now I've spent $100 of the guy's money, and this control head's like 500 bucks. And I said, you know what? I don't have anything to lose. I took the top off of that control head while this thing was going, and I found the little circuit that was going out of it feeding it. All right, so coming out of your control head in there, I found the circuit going out of it inside here. Okay, and I found another circuit that was ground. Now what I did here was I took a little resistor. Well, I actually got my little potentiometer that would that I actually dialed, kept dialing resistance down to the point to where it would short out that eight volts. And it, and it basically I just ran a little resistor inside there to ground. Well, actually, I should have drawn that like a little zigzag. Put that little resistor to ground. I don't remember how many ohms it was. It may have been 25 ohms or something like that. But what that did was it pulled this down to zero volts. And it kept that from happening. But when you turned on the fan on high blow, it would shove enough current out there to pull the fan in. It still worked just fine. And all I did was put what would be very similar to a termination resistor to get rid of this renegade voltage. So that's a jury rig, buddy. <laughs> that's what he's, he's a he's a jury rig king. Well, that's see, yeah, that in that particular case, I did not want to go back to that service rider and tell him that this guy needed a five hundred dollar control head because I had misdiagnosed it. It was easy to do. I mean, I was innocent of any wrongdoing. I didn't just throw a part at it. I tried to scientifically tested it, but I didn't factor in the details. You see where I'm going with that? All right. Anyway, that was. Uh, Something that I did to take care of a problem like that, and it, you know, you're. But whenever you see this on a on an air conditioning system, if you're doing something like that, that's not a big deal. Don't ever modify cruise control that way. Don't ever modify airbag systems that way. You see what I'm saying? Nothing is safety related. Anti lock brakes. Leave that stuff alone. Don't fool with that. Air conditioning not a big deal. You know what I mean? I mean, if it, you know, so what if the air conditioner don't work? He gets hot, you know, and he sweats in his suit, you know. But it that never happened. He never he was happy as a lark. Never, you know, had to bring it back for anything else that related to that. Anyway, uh, all right, where was I? When certain gauges are inoperative in the PCI bus uh, controls, and their PCI bus control every gauge uh, except a fuel gauge on some, some Dodge Neons is, then we have a launch point for our troubleshooting. So some Neons may throw a no bus message on the odometer. You know the little odometer with the green numbers on it? And uh, like on Daniels, if he has any kind of a power steering problem, it'll say power steering on the you know odometer, that kind of thing, that one he's got. All right, so, um, okay, so the vehicle information system showing an accurate compass reading uh, that isn't PCI bus control but displays dashed lines for the rest of the display may be a PCI bus problem. So we want to recognize the bus-related diagnostic trouble code might not contain the word bus and a code we might interpret as a bus-related code might not mean that the bus has failed. So anyway, now the termination values uh, are hard to maybe hard to find unless you got access to a factory shop manual. But once you got them, you can do the math and figure out what the collector resistance should be, or you can use your digital voltometer to measure from the PCI terminal to ground on each module and compare your readings to those in the specs. Now, on your powertrain control module on all except the 98LH model, the termination resistance is 3,300 ohms. Can you remember that? Powertrain control module, and basically what you're doing here, watch this, Daniel. Here's your PCI bus coming out, right? Okay, inside here, kind of like what I was just showing you, the termination resistor to ground, 33K. No, 3.3K, excuse me. That's 3,300 ohms on a PCM. And it's a PCI bus. You're going to take your, mirror, your meter and you're going to take your look right here and you're going to hook it between ground and that bus. And you should read 33,000 ohms on the PCI bus at the powertrain control module. Okay, uh, on the 98LH it's 1,100 ohms. Well, Sentry Key Immobilizer Module, it's 10,800 ohms. And that's the same thing that goes for the transmission control module, the anti lock brake control module, the body control module. Well, I'll accept a 2002 Wrangler, and the body control module on a Wrangler's got 8,000 ohms. The data link connector uh, should open uh, 11,400 with a DRB3 connected, which is a scan tool that Chrysler used for years. And the passenger door module should have 10,800, and the passenger door module on a 2002 and up should have an 8,200 8, ohms. Now, I'll, I don't know what you're going to do with that information other than the fact that if you're doing a, doing bus diagnosis and you want to check and see 
if that termination resistance is screwed up, you know you got something shorted or you know problems in there. Okay. Now then, network bus DTCs basically mean one module has lost communication with another module from which it usually receives data. Okay, if, if the uh, uh, temperature control module is uh, used to receiving uh, engine control temperature information or whatever from the PCM, and all of a sudden it doesn't happen, then it's going to toss you a code for that. I don't see this. You know, I don't see a, I don't see you know, this kind of thing. Like for instance, like Volkswagen I'm fooling with out there right now, um, and it's not a PCI bus, but uh, occasionally, when I'm horsing around with that uh, sentry, I mean that immobilizer problem, uh, when I clear all those codes out of those modules, uh, it'll go through this little stage while I'm plugged into it that the instrument cluster will stop communicating with the PCM, and the PCM will say, "Well," he said, "I don't have any." Kind of, it'll say, "I don't have any kind of uh, of issue here." Uh, that I can determine is a problem, and I don't like what I see, but I'm going to go ahead and start the car. And that little immobilizer will stay on. But it tells me there's a communication problem when I pull the code, right? All right. You've got to find out which modules respond. If you go into all of your modules and you find out, now listen to this. This is pretty important, too. Pay attention to what I'm saying. Don't tune me out, okay? But whenever you go into your module, most of these scan tools nowadays will check every module on the car. If you just punch the right button, it'll check every dead gum module. You got it? All right, so when it checks all the modules, let's say that you know, let's say you got an ABS light on. Can we figure that out? ABS light. All right. So you go in there and you check all your modules, and it tells you your ABS module is not talking. So now what are you going to do? You know you have ABS, because a lot of times the modules, the scan tool will say, no communication or not equipped. Well, you know you got ABS because you got an ABS light on and there's an ABS problem. And it won't talk. So then what do you do? Tell me what you do, somebody. Come on. What were we talked about before? Go there and check the connections, make sure none of the pins are bent back. Well, that's a good thing, but power and ground, you know. I'm going to go to my module and I'm going to find out where am I getting power, where am I supposed to get power, where am I supposed to get ground. I got power there all the time. I got power when I turn on the key. How many grounds I got? Do all of them, are all of them grounded? Uh, any electronic module, you're going to check powers and grounds in that module. And you're also going to look at pin fit. If somebody crammed a test light in there, spread the pin out. Or sometimes, you know, uh, Joe Customer will say, well, I know how to use a test light as good as anybody else. So he jerks the module loose and he starts ramming these, uh, you know, nice tapered test light probes down in there and he spreads those pins out where they won't make any connection. All right. Thank you very much. And I don't know if he's got that one off or not or not. He may not have. It takes a lot to do that. All right. Yeah, put that other on my desk if you don't mind. There's you. All right. Now, right there, okay, you, if none of the modules on a particular PCI bus is talking, you may have a bus that has crashed for whatever reason. Uh, now, here's another thing. Let's say this. Let's say that you, you don't find, if you've got half a dozen modules on this one bus, if you uh, are going here and you, none of them will talk. I say, well, that bus is messed up. All right. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to unplug this module and look at it. See if it starts talking, that module shorted. Plug that one back in. Unplug another one, unplug, put it up. And if I want, finally you unplug the one that's killing the bus, you'll find it that way. See how the process of elimination thing goes? All right. Now I just told them to pull in the fuse that feeds those, each module ain't going to work. You're going to have to unplug the module because the wires are still hooked up. All right. Now, uh, an open PCI bus in a particular area is going to take the modules on that leg of the bus off leg. So what we're talking about here. Anytime you work on electrical stuff, you're going to know how to do this. So uh, you've got a bus that, you know, here's your data link connector, and you've got a, uh, all these modules right here that are like this right here. And let's say that it goes this way, and it goes that way, and you've got modules down this leg of the bus and modules down that leg of the bus, and all of a sudden you find out that you've got four or five or six modules going down that way, and... These modules are all dark, but these are talking. Now, you're going to look at the map of your network bus, and you can find that in the book. It's going to give you a map, a map of that bus. If this wire was cut, these would all go dark, but these would still talk. You see, you understand what I'm saying? Uh, that's, how, that's how that works. Now, your wire can be cut going to your scan tool, too. You could have no problem on your bus, but the scan tool won't talk. So your scan tool becomes a member of that bus network when you plug it in, you see? Okay. Um, let me see. An open low battery voltage can seem like a bus problem. And arcing secondary ignition components, which would be spark plug wires and all, partially shorted electric motors can cause it to react, and they could be a re result of electromagnetic interference, like I was talking about on the Oldsmobile. 
Hang with me, guys. We're almost done. PCI bus has about 7.5 volts when a bus is transmitting data and no volts when it's silent. If it's not talking, there ain't no voltage there. If it is talking, there is. That's why on some of these cars, you've got to hook your scope up while you're talking to it, while communication is going on. If there's no communication going on, do your Morse code. You know, your beep, 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 beep. If there's no message being transmitted, it's dark, isn't it? You don't go beep. You know, you don't do any of that. It's just totally zero. You imagine it like that. Think of it like Morse code, right? All right. Probably the smart aleck to put all this together was thinking about Morse code anyway, because it's real similar to what we're talking about here. They got dots and dashes. I mean, you see where I'm going with that? It's real similar to Morse code, if you think about it. Okay, so when multiple modules transmit messages at the same time, they could collide. The messages can bounce into one another. Imagine that. Now, what if you had two people sending you Morse code at the same time? Try to sort that crap out. You know what I mean? Wait a minute. Who's sending what? I mean, I'm getting all kinds of beep. Dot. These don't even make any sense. These weren't, you know, even if you're good at Morse code, <laughs> if somebody, if you got two, if your two terminals connected to your receiver at the same time, you're not going to be able to parse what they're talking about. What you know, do they have like a relay that delays one and then uh, after transmission over here is yeah. complete and it allows the relay to send the other transmission or something? Well, the message is generated on simultaneously or, or sent based on priority within a few microseconds. I mean, real slow. And that's a collision avoidance system for network messages. It's been around for a while, but basically the computer prioritizes it. Have you ever talked about computers on uh, the computer, like on your desktop computer? Have you ever know what hyper threading is for your engine? I mean, for your P, I mean, for your uh, CPU and all that. You know, they got, two, they got more than one processor now. Like I got quad core, six core. I mean, my gaming machine's got a six core processor in it. My regular machine, I use got a quad core processor in it. But in the olden days, they just had one processor, and it was able to transmit all these messages, but it would give them priority. You know, and after, this one would have to wait while that one went, and it usually worked pretty fast in spite of all that. But Chrysler's collision, uh, Chrysler's CCD network, which is 7.8 kilobits per second, started to fade away in the 98 model year to be replaced by the PCI bus, which was a little bit faster, but not much. It's 10.4 to 10.8 uh, you know, kilobits per second. The PCI bus also features collision avoidance architecture like a CCD bus, but it only uses one wire instead of two, the way the CCD system did. The PCI bus on some Chrysler vehicles was outfitted with, outfitted with a central test point for bus diagnostics. Okay, so what they, and that, that GMC's got that. All of the buses, all of the bus uh, wires come to one point on that thing. And on the Chrysler, it's a square connector with, you know, term, you know with the terminals kind of stacked. On the GMC, it's got a bunch of them in there like that. And each one of those is a separate bus. But they're all hooked together. And this little, there's a jumper that plugs in there and hooks them all together. When you un Let's say that your bus goes down, your whole bus goes down. All right, I want to unhook this. You can unhook that thing and then check your, you know, your termination resistance in each module right there in that one connector. That way you ain't got to go all over the place to do it. You see what I'm saying? And it's also disconnected from your... Uh, your uh, data link too so be aware of that and uh, this stuff right here if you haven't worked with it and uh, a lot of the times I mean some some of you guys your eyes is glazing over and you're thinking when will I ever use this information you know if you get out there and get doing serious car repair work you're going to use this as information and I'm building ground I'm giving you a sort of an overview and an understanding of it right now see what I'm saying All right. but I'm subject to you a pop test only at any time verbal you know just walk up to you in the shop and start asking you about PCI bus how many kilobits per second all that kind of stuff that'd be scary with it can you do that you know that? That's a, that's a shoulder shrug I just sold there. If a module won't communicate, check it for power and ground connections according to the right schematic. Go to your schematic. You know, one of the things I don't understand is I'll have a, there'll be a problem on a car over here, like the, you know, the Crown Victoria that we were talking about that didn't have any power going to the common terminal on the fuel pump relay. And so I tell the guy, you need to find out why it doesn't have any power on that. If you see, if you tell a mechanic that it works on cars every day, the first thing he's going to do is go to the schematic unless he knows that car well enough to where he knows where it comes from. But what I have in here is guys stand there with their hands on the fenders just looking at the car. I don't know why they do that. I don't understand this. You know, if you have to have, you know, I like to say, if, like if I tell you, and this is funny too, if I tell you, I need for you to go to Birmingham, or let's say I need you to go to Muscle Shoals, Alabama, or I need you to go to Mobile, and let's say that you really don't know the way to go to Mobile, so you stand there and look at the highway. Or you get in your car and you just start driving. You know, <laughs> I mean, are you going to ever make it to Mobile that way? No. What you're going to do if you don't know how to get there, you're going to pull out your smartphone and you're going to punch up a map or something, you know, or maybe the uh, the uh, 
you know, Google Earth or whatever, you know what I'm saying, or your GPS, you know, on your, on your phone, you can do that way. But if whatever happens is you need some instructions on how to get there. And that's the way it is with wiring. If you don't have the instructions and on these networks, if you don't know what modules are on which bus and what's talking to what, yeah, this is a lot of nice little boxes that I'm looking at on this little map. That Chrysler scan tool, the star scan that they had that they were was coming out whenever I left the field, it was cool as all get out. It had a touch screen. And whenever you plug that into the data bus, it would go and throw you up a network map of that particular car. And it had all the little boxes and how they were wired up. And if you touched one of those boxes, it would expand that. And you'd be able to pull codes from that box. You'd be able to watch inputs, get data stream from it, close that box out. You go to a different box. See, so you can look at all the different ones on the same bus. Okay. Now then, you've got to check the integrity of the bus system between the module and the data link connector or other modules, and you also check the bus for shorts to power and ground. You've got to recognize it can be shorted either way. Okay, does anybody have any questions or comments to make about that? Did I wear you out? You wore out now? Is your sensory overload and all that? That's okay. You don't have any gray hair yet, so you should be okay. All right. All right. That closes out the little network discussion about.